So, good morning. Thanks for making the talk. Um, actually, it's not my talk. Um, I'm asking to listen to the talk that I'm giving for her. I was just hoping to just kind of hang out and do nothing, but clearly that didn't happen. She got an internship, so I'm giving her a talk. So, I'm going to tell you a little story about uh, some recent studies that we've been doing about um, just the overall effects of gene flow from those populations or unsampled variations on sampled and extant genes. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, some recent study that we've been doing about the uh, unsampled variation on sampled genes. Okay. So, just a brief definition about what exactly I mean when I'm talking about host populations. So, those populations are just populations that can be either extant or extinct. Uh, they're just not sampled uh, because they, they, they might be just hard to capture if you're studying some species of turtle that I, like I used to uh, my PhD work. Uh, uh, you know, they might be endangered, and so it's just not, you know, might be out of the field for 20 days and you catch one turtle. Uh, they might be population decline, recent declines, or they might just be extinct. Um, uh, so you're not able to sample, or they're just complete lack of archaeological samples. Um, there's a lot of examples uh, that we know of where people have estimated uh, the presence of these ancestral archaic populations that have gene flow into current extant populations. Here's some examples from a nice figure I picked from a review by Rasmus Nielsen et al. Uh, where it shows uh, estimated unknown hominin admixture uh, into uh, a lot of current extant genomes. Uh, and then, let's see, some recent paper that was also published which looked at just from a few weeks ago, uh, was Nature Ecology Evolution, uh, colleagues who looked at gene flow from extinct populations of uh, unknown ghost ape population into bonobos. It's interesting because we found, and yeah, I'll tell you about it in a second. Okay, so we know that there's a lot of effects of these unknown uh, ghost population gene flow into current extant genomes. There have been a lot of functional variants that have been also identified in recent studies, a whole bunch of these. Uh, have to do with genes, say, that have introgressed adaptively uh, from Neanderthals into human populations, some that have to do with immunity, immune response genes, skin pigmentation, freckling, tumor suppressor genes, etc. Some of them have also suggested there's been maladaptive genes that have come in uh, and introgressed into human populations. Um, but the bigger question here is how much of this actually affects what we estimate from sample populations? And so uh, we're interested in seeing what the general effect is of unsampled variation on the estimation of summary statistics like MSD or heterozygosity, effective population sizes, etc. And also, more so, if you misspecify a model, what exactly is the effect on the estimation of evolutionary demography under various models? And so, there's been some work that's been done in this. Uh, Peter Fairley did some work uh, way back in 2004. He wrote this cool paper where he actually coined this term. Populations and then my staff can follow that with some theoretical work. Uh, but you know, I have been, it's been radio silence for a few years now, so we figured we'd bring this back up. Uh, so in his case, he basically uh, simulated under a variety of models, specifically under island models of, uh, of migration, uh, varying from no gene flow from uh, an unknown unsampled ghost population all the way up until bidirectional heavy gene flow from this unsampled ghost population to see what the net effects are. Uh, on his tool migrate. Uh, and so, briefly summarizing his results, what he had found was that uh, if you have high migration rates, unidirectional or bidirectional, to and from the coast, it leads to overestimation of population sizes because there, there seems to be influx of allelic variation from these unsampled populations, leading to overestimation of demography. Uh, migration rate estimates, however, seem to be robust, uh, depending, uh, but bias depending on the degree of gene flow from these ghost populations. And uh, increasing the number of sample loci did not really increase or improve uh, the estimation of migration rates. So what we wanted to do is to figure this out, uh, what Melissa wanted to, uh, figure out what exactly would be the effect of these unsampled ghost populations uh, on genomic variation, sample population under an isolation of migration model, which, uh, which I've been working on for a few years now. Uh, and also, if we account for this unsampled variation or unsampled gene flow from those populations, does that actually improve our estimation of evolutionary history? Um, so briefly, Diego went over this. Uh, so the IM model uh, you know, uh, has 
been around for a while now. A uh, pretty simple, simplistic model of allopathic speciation where you have an, um, an ancestral population that splits into two populations or more. Uh, and there's some degree of gene flow that is uh, between them. And under this model, we've developed a series of software that can estimate effective population sizes or population scale mutation rates, uh, divergence times, and migration rates. For this model, uh, there's been a series of software, just a quick plug, for a bunch of these things that I've been developing over the years. Uh, there's IMA2B, which I developed as part of my postdoc, and then more recently, we've put together a software called IMA3, which does some cool estimation, uh, as well as a bunch of other uh, tools we've been developing over the years, uh, collaboration. Also, our professor Jody, Jody Hay. Um, anyway, so what we did was uh, we simulated under a variety of isolation of migration models, uh, starting with uh, basically the same models that Peter did, except his simulations were under uh, an island model. In this case, it's under an isolation of migration model. Starting with uh, a model where you have no gene flow from this unsampled ghost population, all the way up until model E, which has lots and lots of. Uh, gene flow from bidirectional gene flow from this unsampled ghost. Uh, caveat of this again is that we fixed the tree in this case. Obviously, the ghost happens to be an upper, uh, uh, but we're doing some more simulation work recently where you'd be wary of where the ghost actually is. <coughs> so we simulated a bunch of, so we simulated haplotype data using MS, uh, three populations, 10 deployed individuals, 10 samples, uh, loci, 10 replicates that are each model. We estimated a bunch of summary statistics. From that, the expectations here is that there will be greater bias in these estimates. Uh, for instance, if you would have lots of gene flow from uh, unsampled ghost populations and you just completely ignore it from your model, we would expect that the FST estimates would be much higher in sample populations uh, if you have lower migration, whereas if you have higher migration, there's be uh, uh, it'd be higher. Sorry, it'd be lower. Similarly, genomic diversity would also be uh, measured as theta, would be higher in populations with higher migration rates and lower in populations with lower migration rates. Uh, exactly what we found. So what we found, for instance, I'm going to orient you to these, I'm going to point you to some of the population one and population two are the sampled populations. And uh, models are on the x-axis. Uh, model with uh, no gene flow from those populations is A. Model with lots of gene flow from those populations is E. Uh, clearly, we see that uh, pi, which uh, and psychogenic sites, which are related to genomic diversity broadly, uh, seems to be uh, overestimated in these populations, depending on how much gene flow there is. Um, interestingly enough, uh, TGMSD, uh, which is you know uh, uh, seems to be affected by demographic models, which we kind of know how that happens. FSD also seems to be showing the opposite pattern, where uh, if you have lots of gene flow from unsampled ghost populations. Clearly, underestimate uh, the sample FST. <clears throat> so, we proceeded to ask this question about how this affects uh, the estimation of evolution history under the IM model. Uh, so, we did three types of runs. So, one was where we ran IMA2P uh, under a three population model as if we sampled all, all the three populations. We down sampled the data set and then we ran it as if we just sampled two populations. And then we also ran it such that in the new programs, we've actually added an option where you can add an unsampled ghost to your model and estimate parameters into it. Uh, and we did a bunch of things, and briefly, lots of computational hours later, here's what we found. We consistently underestimate uh, divergence times depending on the degree of gene flow uh, between populations. So this one is under model A, uh, whereas that one is under model E, where there's lots of gene flow from ghost populations. We clearly see a pattern of underestimation of divergence times. If you look at, oops, if you look at migration rates, we also underestimate migration rates. These are migration rates between sampled populations. Depending on the degree of gene flow, we clearly see that there seems to be a bias in terms of the amount of migration rates that we estimate between sampled populations. And interestingly enough, we also recapitulate the fact that we overestimate population sizes, same thing that uh, Peter found in his models as well, uh, between the two. So if you have low gene flow uh, or no gene flow, you seem to be accurately estimating uh, effective population sizes, whereas if you have lots of gene flow, you clearly overestimate uh, the effective population size. So <clears throat> we also tried to do an empirical example of this, and we published this recently as part of the IMA3 paper, it was an MBE recently. Uh, where uh, we use this empirical data set from Joe Lachance, no, I think Joe's 
in the audience somewhere. Shout out to him. Um, where uh, so he published this cool paper uh, where they looked at uh, ancestral introgression into African hunter-gatherer populations. And so we used some of this data set from Hadza, Sandawi, and uh, uh, pygmy populations. Uh, in his study, uh, they showed uh, clearly that there was a greater estimate of TMRCA in introgress regions. Uh, they also looked at uh, structure and a variety of other summary statistics and showed clearly that there was greater support for gene flow from um, ancestral close population. And so we took this data set, we augmented it. Uh, we had three Baka, five Hadza, five Sandawe, and uh, seven Yoruba genomes. Uh, sampled 200 loci from across this estimated evolutionary history under uh, various models. Specifically, we used a four population model, and then we used a four population model with a ghost. And here's what we found. We clearly estimate a greater posterior probability for a model which has five populations where they have a, an ancestral ghost. Interestingly enough, what we found was that under a model where you have four populations, you clearly underestimate migration rates. You basically say there's no migration between any of these populations. Whereas if you add a ghost into this model, we clearly see that there's significant migration from this ancestral ghost into same populations. We also um, overestimate uh, population sizes under a model uh, where there's no ghost populations. Whereas clearly we see uh, an underestimate, well, correct, correct estimates of the model we uh, the model with the ghost. So, what is the take home from this? You have whatever kind of data set that you are, for example, those populations can introduce bias into your estimates, so account for them. It's as simple as that. Uh, there are lots of software that allow you to do that at this point, so a you little know, plug for some of these things that I've been doing. Uh, IMA3 works very well because it also estimates uh, the tree topology, so you don't have to actually fix the tree topology when you estimate your demographic history. Uh, you can do demographic inference uh, with varying topology models. Lots of loci, I paralyzed it so you can run it with multiple, uh, hundreds of loci, uh, get pretty reliable estimates. Um, so yesterday, uh, one of my uh, uh, colleagues, he also gave a talk about this recent uh, pipeline that we've been developing for doing anything pop gen, we're going to call it PPP, uh, it's available on PIP at this point. Uh, it's called Pipe Pop Gen, uh, do, do check it out. And with that, I want to acknowledge Melissa, who did all this work. Uh, Eugene, Vitor, who have been helping a lot of, a lot with my analyses and it's uh, for London. So that would take a question. Thanks. Yeah. Can you tell me about the effects of sample size on the estimation of uh, these? Great question. I, I kind of ignored that. Um, there are no effects. That's what we found. So we sampled anywhere between two loci, five loci, and hundred loci. Really, the estimates don't change the changes. In terms of individuals, though, I think you use 10 individuals. Correct. So oh, yeah. So uh, in terms of individuals, also it does not change. So it's interesting. So the IM models, uh, the number of individuals really does not uh, change the estimates. Uh, all you need is a, you, know, you have a couple of genomes. You can, you can still estimate them pretty accurately. 